Sure. It'll pop up on the screen. Yep. It says recording pending. Oh, oh there, there we go. go. All right, you can start. Yeah, okay. You know, we'll All right. Pull that up. Yep, Great. no problem. Okay, so I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Carrie Ann Anderson. I am the event supervisor for the Macomb Science Olympiad Elementary Arthropods. Uh, welcome to our uh, new version of how we're doing our um, coaches meeting today. Um, we are going to have an open chat session. Uh, so if you do have questions while I go over the information, I believe you're going to be able to um, type those questions in and we'll be able to see them and hopefully refer back to them and answer whatever questions you have. Um, and if after this meeting, for some reason, you have additional questions, the um, best place for you to communicate with me and with the Science Olympiad team is to go to the FAQ section under the Arthropods event. You would type in your question and we would get back to you in a timely manner. And sometimes your questions that you have have already been answered and on that FAQ section. So um, if you're needing some additional clarification, that would be a really useful tool for you to, um, to have. So I'm going to start out the meeting um, talking mainly about testing. Um, just a quick reminder, there are no practice tournaments being held, so it's the only competition that we will be meeting at is the one in May, May 15th on a Saturday. And therefore, in this scenario for arthropods, you are going to be required not only to take the uh, kind of station-based exam, but you also will be turning in your arthropod collection. So in the past, when we had our practice tournaments, it was only the exam, and then you didn't have to worry about the collection until the second time that you tested. Um, but for 2021, we are going to have both of them on the May 15th date. Um, you will be required to um, come in for the examination. Um, for those of you that are joining that have not done this before, it is a station-based lab practicum. Um, your student will have one minute per station and there's approximately 100 questions on the exam, so potentially 20 stations. Um, depending on the level of difficulty for um, the content matter, you might have three or maybe even five or six questions per station. Um, they do not rotate on their own. You have to actually wait the full one minute before you're rotating. Um, there will be a monitor in the room with the students and they will have the students rotate to their station and the students will see a folder and the monitor will say you may begin. That's when the student opens up the folder and they start answering their questions. When they are finished, they just close the folder and they sit there and wait until the monitor says time's up, close your folder. Now we're going to rotate to the next station. Um, the students are allowed the one sheet um, normal size paper uh, front and back for notes during the examination. Um, my advice is to study, 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 and then only put what the students are struggling with on that sheet of paper. If you tend to fill it up with too much information, it's, it renders itself not useful because they can't find it in time. Um, you will have uh, access on the arthropod uh, website to download and uh, print one of the examples of the zip grade forms that are available and that's what they're going to be using in testing. Um, it's very similar to uh, Scantron where you have to fill in a bubble depending on the A, B, C, D, or E multiple choice question. Um, practice that with your students. Some are not familiar with utilizing those forms and um, 
it's it's a little bit painful to see them uh, be introduced to a form like that on test day. Um, so make sure that they're comfortable learning how to navigate those forms and how to properly fill in the bubbles. Also, a quick reminder, um, not every team will start on question number one at station one. So like your team, when they enter the room, they're gonna be directed to a specific station and they might be starting on like question 25. So it's a good idea to um, practice that with your students and have them um, you know, say, okay, today you're gonna walk into the room and you're starting on question 40. So I want you to find question 40 on your exam and I want you to put your finger on it and wait for the monitor um, to say you may open and begin. So um, if they are starting on question 40 in the lab practicum, but they're filling out the bubble for question number one, it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> so make sure you uh, get them real confident in utilizing a zip grade form, please. Um, there, th it's multiple choice. And the only time that they're going to have to actually fill in or write an answer would be in a tiebreaker situation. So there will be a station that everybody takes the tiebreaker and um, then we only grade or utilize that tiebreaker if there is in fact a tie. Okay. Um, I'm not, uh, a lot of times people are wondering if they have to know how to spell all these very difficult scientific terms. Um, spelling hasn't come into play too often, but if the tiebreaker is a tiebreaker, sometimes spelling <laughs> is part of that. So, um, if they're having difficulty with spelling some of these words, that's that's a really good thing to put on that sheet of paper uh, that would help them spell something correctly. But uh, for multiple choice purposes, they really won't have to know that. Um, how are things going to look a little different because of uh, COVID and um, keeping uh, spacing proper? Uh, I was told that we will have a larger space to run the lab practicum than what we've had in the past. Um, I will ensure that there's more spacing between the individual stations. And um, because uh, arthropods are sometimes so tiny, it is important still for the students to be able to pick up the specimens that they're identifying. So if they're at a station where they have to pick up something, um, I will make sure that it is sanitized between that one minute rotation between stations. Um, I guess at this point in time, Nikita, can we, are there questions coming in or not? Do you, can you see that? Um, I don't see any questions right now. Okay, because I'm, I'm not seeing any on my end, so I just want to make sure. Okay. So. That is a, just a brief explanation of how the lab practicum portion of the tournament will go. Um, I'm going to move on to the collection at this point. Uh, just a few things before we pull up the rubric, Nikita. So hold on one moment. Um, the collection can be either a photographic or the pinned or pinned slash vial um, specimen version. Uh, on the arthropod um, website for the event, you will see a link that says um, rubric. It's, it's an arthropod collection scoring rubric. See, so when you are kind of wondering what, what I'm going to do when grading these, you can look at that rubric and you can follow the individual steps and we'll put that up in just a minute. And um, Essentially, as a coach, as a team, you will know your score on that portion of the tournament prior to even turning it into me. Sometimes there are some surprises, like for instance, if you thought something was identified as like a Malacostraca, and when I looked at it, I realized that it indeed was not a Malacostraca. Sometimes there's those discrepancies, but usually the coach has a pretty firm grasp as to what that score is. And if you look at the rules, 
in a few moments, you'll realize that the collection portion is 30% of the grade and the lab practicum is the 70% of the grade. So turning in a um, collection is really important. Um, now, turning in procedures are still being discussed as, um, as we move forward um, planning this in a safe manner. Um, but I will be grading them using the rubric. I'll be grading them the day of. You will be receiving the collection back that same day along with a copy of the graded rubric. And what we've done in the past is when I hand those things back to you, uh, the coaches usually kind of go off to the side, review the rubric with their students. And if there's any type of, um, if you wanted to con uh, contest some point deduction, or if you just wanted some further explanation of why points were deducted, um, or if you were looking at how to improve for next year, I would be available to discuss that with you before that score is um, sent to the, um, the, the people that submit it into the computers. So um, why don't we go ahead and put up that rubric. Sounds good. And while I'm putting up the rubric, there was one question asking if you use ZipGrade. The, the, yes, the exam portion is a zip grade form. So the exam, the station by station based part of the tournament is all zip grade. And you can download a copy of that zip grade on the events page. And I advise downloading the 100 question zip grade form um, so that because that's that's really the one that um, they're going to be using in my in my event, because I normally have 100 questions, and it's obviously A, B, C, D, or E, multiple choice. Are there any more questions? Nope, that was the only one. Okay, hopefully I answered that. Okay, so, oh, can we go to the, um, yes. So this is an example of the rubric that I use for the um, collection. If you look at the notes on the top, I know that's really small, but um, the actual speci specimens need to be in their adult form or their nymph form. And so um, we can't have, for instance, if you've collected a Lepidoptera, which is a butterfly or moth, you cannot have the caterpillar form in your collection. It has to be the adult. And um, the caterpillar form in Lepidoptera is called a larva. So that's not acceptable. Adults are nymphs. So what does a nymph mean, you're probably asking. So a nymph would be an example in Orthoptera, where Orthoptera is like your crickets, your grasshoppers, katydids. See, those particular um, young organisms look identical but maybe smaller than the adult version. So those ones I can um, accept. So hopefully that makes it more clear for you. Um, these organisms have to be local in origin. So um, it has to be able to be found in Michigan. That doesn't mean that um, it has to be a native to Michigan. So sometimes we have organisms that are non-native that are found in Michigan. So if it's local in origin, that is okay, it's acceptable. Um, good conditioned, pinned, and re or recognizable in the photo is important um, for me to be able to give you the point value. Um, if for some reason, you know, your grasshopper's leg falls off, that's okay too. Um, you can glue or keep the grasshopper's leg uh, next to it. So um, an important thing is to, it, it did say that it has to be collected or photographed within a year of the Science Olympiad competition date. Uh, that's a little different this year because our last competition date um, didn't happen um, in 2020. So we are accepting those organisms if you had them saved um, and you kept them in your freezer, uh, you can go ahead and use those. And just try to make sure that you're truly having your team members collect these. We don't want uh, you to have um, outside help in that matter. And if the coach is 
participating with you. We hope that the coach is um, showing uh, good practices and helping the kids collect the organisms, but not necessarily doing it for them. So, okay, looking at what's expected of you, notice you've got three points for each arthropod class. So your classes that you need to um, focus on are the six that you see there. Um, just a word for the wise, your arachnidas, like spiders and harvestmen, chylopodas, your centipedes, columbula, your springtail, and your diplopida, your millipedes. Those, um, one, two, three, four, those first four, those are considered soft body organisms, and um, you can go ahead and just put those in vials. Um, obviously, freeze them first so that they are um, deceased, and then bring them out, let them hit room temperature, gather a little bit more moisture, and then put it into a 70 or 90% isopropyl alcohol vial. The vials are um, available for you to purchase through our website and highly recommended over any other type of container. If you're wondering how to do this properly, I've also posted a video for you on the website. Um, Insecta, most of those will be pinned, uh, except for Ephemenoptera, your mayflies, or you guys sometimes refer to them as fish flies. Those are soft bodies, so those can go in isopropyl alcohol. Or if you have something very small, like a flea for Siphonoptera or a fruit fly um, in Diptera, you can try to utilize a triangle point, or you could put those in alcohol as well. Um, all of that, again, is in, um, in our uh, downloadable files on the website. Malica straca, uh, usually I get one of two options there from people. Uh, a roly-poly um, is usually pinned, or if you have a crawfish, or as you refer to them here in Michigan, crayfish, um, there's two options. You can put it in alcohol if you'd like, or you can pin it. Uh, what I'm asking though from all of my, um, my coaches out there, I know crawfish are really cool for kids to um, catch and explore and have an experience with, and that's wonderful if you do that. But if you're going to choose one versus the other, um, I would prefer a roly-poly in the um, in the collection. Uh, crawfish are really difficult to pin properly without them smelling the entire room up. Um, you really have to dry them out before you put them in your uh, collection. I've had collections kicked to the door for a few hours before I grade them because they smell so bad. So if you have a choice, why not choose this tiny little roly-poly instead of this ginormous crawfish that stinks? Um, so that's uh, your arthropod class. If you meet one specimen that belongs to each of these classes, then you would get full point value. If for some reason you were not able to find a columbula, for instance, it's usually the harder one to find a springtail, then you would not receive the maximum point value of 18. You would only receive um, 15 points. So that's how that works. Um, if you look at the insect orders, there are um, several to choose from. I You only have to come up with 10 of the insect orders. So one specimen per 10 orders. So like you have 14 here and there's others possible because we have way more than 14 orders that exist in Michigan. But if you find one specimen for 10 different orders, then you would receive full maximum point value um, of 50 there. Um, if I have an other section, so I've had people come up with silverfish or, or thrips and before, which are not listed there. So I accept those and I just write them in. <clears throat> if you go to the next page on the rubric, yes, that one, one point per specimen. So maximum 30 specimens. I really do not want or need more than 30 specimens in the container that you're providing or the photo album. Um, specifically for the pinned specimens, the there are size restrictions and more than 30 would get a little um, crowded. 
And so if you do have more than 30, I can only grade 30. So it's the first 30 I see. Um, duplicates do not count. So if you have, let's say, a monarch butterfly that fits the criteria of Lepidoptera, so you received five points for that, it also fits the criteria of Insecta, so you get three points for that, but you've placed two monarch butterflies in your kit. It does not fit the description of 30 unique specimens. So be careful there. Um, but just because you don't, if you cannot reach the six um, classes and you cannot reach the 10 orders, it doesn't mean you can't reach the 30 specimens, right? So if you do have, a, if you're struggling with the orders and you are not struggling finding Lepidoptera like butterflies and moths, go ahead and put a monarch, go ahead and put a cabbage white, go ahead and put a gypsy. You know, you can put five or six butterflies in there to help you reach that 30 specimen goal. Absolutely. <clears throat> Next page. Quality of work. Um, how I look at this in the rubric, everyone starts out with 10 points um, and then I deduct from there. So you, you automatically have the 10. I automatically assume you're doing a great job. And so um, collection box requirements and photographic collection is in an album or poster. I've seen much more success with albums than posters. I'll be honest with you on that. Um, Organization is key. It's key for Ms. Carrie Ann because I have to grade these very fast. So when I mean organization, what you want to do is start from the top and you want to label or in your album, you want to label a page arthropod class. And then you want each subsequent page to be labeled each of the classes. And then you put your photographs on each one or in the pinned, you would label arthropod class at the top you would label all your arthropod classes and you would put your specimens directly above the tag that has all that important information on it that we talked about earlier. So, oh, that's in the next line. That's your state, county, nearest city, date, location, behavior, and the name of the collector. And then after you reach all of your classes, the biggest one is going to be Insecta, right? So you would put Insecta underneath and then you would list all of your orders and radiate down from there, having your um, all of your beetles in your Coleoptera grouped together. Don't have a beetle here and a beetle here and a beetle here and a beetle up here. Um, that's not grouped first by class and then by order. Um, that's usually where people lose their points the most. Um, using your pins properly and vials used properly um, I do understand that you are in elementary and I will just use my best discretion. If you tried really hard, I think you're going to get full point value there. Um, a misrepresented arthropod collection. Um, I haven't had this happen in the past, but you know, we're just hoping that collections are not being passed down from one year to the next. Um, I did start taking photographic uh, evidence of previous teams um, uh, collections just so we don't receive like something completely identical. Um, so that would be where we would talk about supervisor's discretion and whether or not we feel that uh, the collection was truly done by your student and not necessarily by the adult. Sometimes people wonder like with the tags, should we have our students um, write in the tags or should we have them type them and print the um, labels so that's up to you uh, the first year I did this as a parent as a coach I had my students uh, write them and I quickly learned that you know fourth grade writing capabilities on small labels can get pretty messy pretty fast um, but they didn't uh, they had all the information on the label so and it was legible so that it's not like they weren't going to get the same amount of points as someone who typed them, okay? But just be careful when you're typing. Um, make sure that your students are actually typing those labels because they actually learn from that. So um, that's just one little pointer there. Are there any questions in regards to the rubric? Um, 
Do we have anything, Nikita? Uh, we have two questions. Okay. One was asking about collection. So um, can we collect from the Great Lakes region or just Michigan? Um, I, I believe it's Midwest. Midwest, okay. Yeah, and, and as long as you can find that species in Michigan. So you can go to Wisconsin and you can collect a um, black-legged tick um, as long as a black-legged tick is also found in Michigan. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So on your label, I have no problem with it saying, you know, Ohio or Wisconsin, but um, just make sure that that species is found commonly also here. Yep, she gave a thumbs up. Okay, uh, good. She also asked if we can use the same box. Yes, you can recycle that box. Absolutely. And I'm glad you put, brought that up. Um, you know, the box doesn't have to be some really expensive purchased from a uh, collection store. Um, you can, what I've done in the past is, you know, those uh, paper boxes that reams of paper come in. Um, if it's, it's actually really easy. You take the bottom portion of the paper box that is probably too tall, right? And you cut that in half. You just shave it off and, and reduce the height of it by half. And then you put your uh, half inch to an inch foam or styrofoam into the box. You fit it in real nice. Then you have the lid from the paper box that fits right over it. It's um, cheap, it's easy, and uh, it's really durable. And I've always let my students um, decorate the top of the box however they want, get the paint out, get the markers out, have fun with it. We had one more question saying, does the website have photos of example collections from years past? Hmm. I know in my one of my videos, when I talk about pinning, I do show a high scoring, um, collection that was um again it's it looks just like a fourth grader put it together but i wanted to show that as an example of still being able to receive full credit value um i will have to check and see if the photographs are in i believe on in your study guide let me check the study guide real quick i believe in the study guide we might have some photos I could be wrong though. We've switched things up a little bit. And I know I used to bring examples to the face-to-face -face coaches meeting. No, nope, it's not in the study guide. Why don't I put that up as something maybe we can uh, do very soon for you. But I do know I have one pinned example in the, um, in the video for how to pin your collection. She gave a thumbs up, so that sounds good. Um, Shay, you have your hand raised if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, this is Carrie Ann. On Hi. The Facebook pages, there are from last year, uh, not last year, obviously, but the year before on the Science Olympiad Facebook pages, there's photos that were done and posted of the kids with their boxes from that I year. You're right. I remember that. Yes. So you shouldn't have to. They can just go look up Science Olympiad on Facebook and find those. Thank you for reminding me. That was the first year that I've seen that happen. Yes. Um, one thing, just a comment there. Um, you know, coaches, let's let's just uh, be really encouraging and um, positive when it comes to viewing other people's collections. Um, I think having those students' collections put out there was a, a wonderful celebration of their, their hard work that they've done. But unfortunately, it did um, create a little bit of a, um, why did this person receive this score? Look at their collection, <laughs> things like that. Um, I'm, I'm the grader. And what I have determined what is full point value or not is, is up to me and my team. So um, that is going to stick, okay? <laughs> Whether you comment on those or not, <laughs> okay. Um, Pamela, I see you also have your hand raised if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question. 
Yes, thank you. I haven't coached this before, but the, the man who coached it previous to me had a comment that the team had soft body specimens and vials, and then the collection was kept in the car for the rest of the afternoon and while they attended the big ceremonial award session. And it was a hot day. Yeah. In and what he said is that the vials exploded. Do you know oh. about that happening? And if that's common and how do you have to keep your, your vials after you put the alcohol in them? And if there's any tips about that issue? I have never heard of that before. Um, I do remember the last Science Olympiad tournament was a very warm day, and I was I was a little bit nervous about uh, storing even my uh, lab practicum um, specimens in my vehicle. I did not put them in my vehicle. Um, I was more worried about smell uh, than the actual explosion. I've never heard of that, but uh, what I do advise, um, and I'm glad you brought that up so I can bring this up. When you're bringing your collection to the tournament, I have a video on how to properly pin your vials into your collection, but I don't advise pinning them until you get to the tournament, meaning I would um, store them upright in a smaller container so they're not getting jostled around. If you pin them into your collection and then you're carrying this big collection, um, through a parking lot and turning it into me, what happens is those files could get dislodged and they roll and then they could like damage the rest of your specimens, breaking legs off, heads off, things like that. So I do advise that and I usually bring that up at the coaches meeting. So thank you for reminding me on that one. Um, I guess proper storage would be room temperature and we all know how hot a car can get, especially if the windows are up. So uh, just show discretion and keep it maybe at your table with your um, the main supervisor for that school until it's ready to, um, to be ready to go home. I think that's all the questions we had for now, but if any more come in the chat, I'll let you know. Okay, I know doing the collection seems like a very daunting task. Um, it is going to be, um, you know, slow to start. We're in the winter season. Uh, you can still find a lot of specimens out there today um, on a sunny day with blue skies above 30 degree temperatures. Get your kids out there and start, you know, rolling over logs and rocks and digging under the snow. Um, you will find a a lot of your classes out there still. Um, as far as some of your orders, you're going to have to wait, right? Because some of them do not emerge until um, really close to the tournament date. Some won't emerge at all prior to the date. You would have had to have collected them over the summer months. Um, if you're new to this and you didn't have that opportunity to collect over the summer, um, I apologize for that, but I do, I can tell you because I was in your same uh, situation um, when I was a first time coach and we started in February and we were still able to find everything that was needed to have a, um, a full graded perfect score on the collection. So it is possible. Uh, I have, I encourage you to um, go out there and find those specimens and get that Get that spring towel, get that columbula on a hot day. Look at the base of a tree, um, get a little tiny spoon and lay on the snow and wait until you see little black dots moving. And then, you know, you've got your columbula. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, let's move on to the actual uh, rules and how to study. Okay, we've gone over quite a bit of this, but I wanted to just make notion to the um, table one and table two. So table one, if you look at that, it's called the arthropod classes. What do you need to know? Key characteristics of each listed arthropod class in insect order. And then you go to um, visually recognizing the specimen and, um, describing the basic biology and anatomy. So um, 
recently I was able to give you a good workbook for anatomy because I know um, I didn't want the students studying like all the anatomy, like digestive system, circulatory system, respiratory system, all the anatomy. So I wanted to focus the students on the key points of the anatomy that actually determine why those specific organisms are classified as an arthropod um, arachnid or an arthropod diplopoda. So um, you do have this available to download. It's um, it's called your workbook for arthropod classes. OK, and when you open it up, you have uh, kind of a worksheet for each one where you fill in the. Um, the anatomy of each of the classes. Now, when it comes to insecta, there's there's so many different orders of insecta and their anatomy is not similar. Um, there's some basics that are the same, but not in general. So um, I did a separate workbook for insect order because we are only going to focus predominantly on two main order types for anatomy this year, and that's Diptera and Lepidoptera. So you have those workbooks to help you with the anatomy portion. Um, recognizing is something that you'll have to just work on with your students. Uh, show them a picture and have them identify where it falls, whether it's an arachnid, a chylopoda, calembola, diplopoda, insecta, or malacostraca. Now, when it goes into insect orders, uh, again, we have the list of the insect orders for you. There are many more insect orders out there in Michigan or the Midwest region, but these are the ones we've selected. Um, there's 14 of them. So uh, at the very basics, they should be able to recognize what type of species or what type of organism falls into those orders. So for Blatodia, they should know cockroaches and termites. Um, for Coleoptera, they should know beetles. Um, so you would have to start there and then work your way into more of the specifics and details behind them. Um, one of the easy ways to recognize order is to really look at the Greek meaning of the name. So um, when you look at things like um, uh, coleoptera, coleoptera in Greek means sheath wing. What is a sheath? Well, if you look at any type of beetle, their forewings are not flimsy or fragile like some of the other um, insect orders. Their forewings are hard or they're a protective sheath or shield um, that uh, protects their body. So that's why all beetles belong to coleoptera. And when you look at the word, the Greek meaning of patura, that just means wings. So coleo means sheath and then patura means wings. So you can maybe start there. It helps the students really understand these difficult words and that they have really simple meanings. Um, then you should know the key physical characteristics of these organisms, key be behavioral um, metamorphosis, habitat, diet, and their role in the ecosystem. A lot of that would be found in your Amazing Arthropods study guide. And that's available for you to download and print. Any questions about specific order or class? And then we'll go into species. I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay, we'll go into species. On the next page. Now, what do you do with these species? Um, well, we're just diving deeper, okay? Um, I wanted to make sure that uh, students had an opportunity to um, understand an organism a little bit further than just its order. So within an order, there are specific species, and each species is just so physically and behaviorally and just just so different in their characteristics. And so I wanted to celebrate some of the ones that are more commonly seen here in our backyards and in our um, environment so that when they are you know, beyond tournament date, when they are outside, they might have some of that background knowledge as to what they're seeing like on a tree or in their backyard. So um, we are celebrating uh, the 
Lepidopteras this year and the Dipteras this year. Um, Lepidoptera being your butterflies and moth. So I made sure that I uh, celebrated each one of those equally. So we have some butterflies, we have some moths. We, in that species list, we have, you know, beautiful colored butterflies, but we also have dull butterflies. We have beautiful moths and dull moths. So there's not one versus the other. Um, we have some that are very rare. We have some that are uh, not even native and somewhat dis um, destructive to our um, maybe agricultural or um, forestry uh, habitat here in Michigan. So these are your arthropod species for Lepidoptera, for Diptera. Um, I celebrated just a few, I, I chose four. Um, some of which, again, are not native, some of which are uh, very useful uh, in forensics. Um, some are useful and show very unique uh, uh, survival instincts with mimicry and so forth. So I made sure that those were in there. A lot of ecological uh, characteristics and factors. Arachnids, I chose a couple ticks and then the rest were spiders. And then for Malacostraca, I chose two crawfish to focus on, one of which is um, native and the other is not. So um, when you're doing the arthropod species, uh, the best thing that I could, I could give to you as a team and make it not feel as cumbersome is this workbook that you can download on the website. And it's a little booklet. You can fold it to be a booklet. And what I would do, and this is what I did when um, I was coaching myself, my, my son a long time ago, um, I had him and his partner divvy up the arthropod species list. And in 50% you know, 50 50 uh, equal, and then they had to fill out the booklet, one booklet per species. And then um, whatever like 15 species my son did, he would then have to teach that information to his partner and vice versa. So when you open up the booklet, it really is clear as to what you should know for each individual species. Um, obviously, what does it look like? Um, is there a distinct difference between male and female varieties. Um, how do they feed? So insect mouth parts are important to know. Um, how does it defend itself? Um, and what is its life cycle? So that's just the first page there. And then you open up some more and you dive a little deeper into the habitat. Where would you find the species? Um, if it's native or non-native? What is its conservation status? Meaning, is it endangered or threatened? Is it um, under special concern? There is a link on the back of your study guide that will give you, hopefully, the most recent Michigan conservation status um, list. Now, what's interesting about looking up a list like that from MSU Extension is the list is according to the scientific name. So that's why I have you look up the scientific name first and put it on your booklet so that you can find it easier when you get to that um, list for conservation status. Um, is the organism invasive? And if it is invasive, how? Like, is it a pest? Is it harmful to human health? What's going on? But if it's not invasive, is it helpful? Like, what is its role, ecological niche in the environment, or has it been determined to actually help humans in some way, shape, or form? A lot of the helpfulness would be like in pollination and stuff for agricultural purposes. Um, so yeah, you could fill out the booklet and study from there those specific um, species. Do I have any questions about that? There's no questions in the chat. Wow. Okay, we're rolling along then. Um, so I guess um, the best way to approach the amount of information that your student is about to tackle, um, start really broad. Start by understanding what an arthropod actually is. 
and then go into classes. Um, you only have six, and of those six, um, several of them only have one type of specimen that would belong to the class. Um, the insecta is the big one. So get them really comfortable with just utilizing those six classes first and foremost. Um, there is in your study guide this really awesome diconomous key, and that will help them understand the key characteristics for each of the classes and how to utilize the diconomous key correctly is really important. Um, Just a quick interruption. I think we're reaching the 45 minute time. Okay. So some participants may have to leave. Okay, so after the class, then just move into your orders, and then after they have a firm grasp on the orders, start with the species specifics. I hope that helps, and if you have any more questions, I'm here for a few more minutes, and then you can um, also go to FAQs. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, I...